All right, well, friends, it's Easter, and um, I get the question sometimes, as a pastor, do you ever, like, kind of dread, you know, because you have Christmas and you have Easter, and kind of tells you what you have to preach? I just want to know, you know, that's a bad question. That, this is my favorite. I love Christmas. I love teaching the incarnation of Christ, and I love being present for um, Monday, Thursday, and, and Easter, because this is the point of it all. So, no, I never get tired of this. It is an awesome, uh, awesome experience to be in worship on Easter Sunday with you and to know that the risen Lord Jesus Christ continues to have a desire and a will for us to reveal his kingdom in this world. So today we're going to dive in. I have a little replica of the original tabernacle. Um, it was made by uh, the Veenstra family, and it's an awesome, uh, it's really well done. There's even a little bowl for the burnt offering. Right there, pretty awesome, except for the bowl. And, um, and, and what this is, is this is a representation of something we have to understand. There was a covenant before Christianity. And um, Easter is in many ways a retelling of an old promise. I want to say that again. Easter is the retelling of an old promise. Last week, Thursday, Ray Vanderlaan was here teaching, which if you ever want to feel insecure as a pastor, have Ray Vanderlaan teach. I was like, oh, this should be your job. Um, but oh, it was so good. And he talked about what went on in the blood covenant, in the blood path, where God walked the blood path of Genesis 15 and said, not only do I make this blood covenant with you, which was common in the ancient world, I will also fulfill it. And that was the uncommon part of it. And then he would have, at, um, God would eventually lead Moses to save the people of Israel out of Egypt. They would set up this tabernacle according to God's instructions. And um, they would have a sacrificial system where at uh, 9 in the morning, they would sacrifice either a, goal, a bull, a goat, a ram, or a pigeon. And then at uh, 3 in the afternoon, they would do the same thing. So they would do these things. It coincided perfectly with the, um, the death of Christ, took place at the last sacrifice of the day that would have happened in the temple. And so we're understanding that Easter is the retelling of an old promise. So I want you to, to kind of join me here for a minute and get your head around something that maybe is a little outside of a normal Easter uh, teaching, but, but it really matters. So that thing on the bottom here, if any of us saw Raiders of the Lost Ark, we know what that is, right? That's the Ark of the Covenant there. That would have been the Jewish Ark of the Covenant. And, um, and there is this promise that takes place in Scripture. And the reason the teaching is titled, um, There I Will Meet You, is because in Exodus chapter 25, verses 17 to 22, I'll kind of paraphrase them, it says this, Make for me, after God gives specific instructions for the Ark, he says, Make for me a mercy seat. Make that mercy seat two and a half cubits long, by a cubit and a half wide, and on it have two cherubim at either end out of hammered gold. Make the mercy seat and the cherubim one piece of hammered gold, and set the cherubim on either end of the mercy seat, and have them facing towards one another with their wings outstretched and their eyes on the mercy seat. And God goes on to say this, you shall put the mercy seat with the cherubim on top of the ark, and there I will meet you. There I will meet you. And from above the mercy seat, from between the two cherubim, that is where I will meet you, on the Ark of the Covenant. Now we know this. The Ark of the Covenant was not out here in the tabernacle or here or even in this first section. There's this little section in the back called the Holy of Holies. We'll talk about that in just a minute. But the Holy of Holies was a place separated completely apart completely apart, and only one person could go into it a year, and that would have been the high priest whose lot had been drawn, and most likely if you were a priest in the, is, in the Jewish uh, religious system, you probably never got the honor or opportunity to go into the Holy of Holies. Very few people ever did because it was a once-a-year thing, and there was this curtain that was 60 feet tall, 30 feet wide, and super thick, right? Really, really thick. Now, there's no exact dimensions on the thickness. We just know it was a very thick, heavy curtain because it took close to 300 priests to hoist that thing into place. Oh, have you ever had to hang a curtain at home? 
And you're like, oh, it didn't take 300 of you, did it, right? Think of how large this was. So it was a massive curtain that separated the presence of God where he said, there I will meet you, and the people of God. It was for their safety. God kept them away. So, so he had this, this covenant with them, and he said, have this set up this way, and there I will meet you. We're going to talk today about the mercy seat. We're going to use Hebrews chapter 9 to unpack this a little bit. Hebrews chapter 9, verses 1 to 8 says this. Now, now this is the um, Hebrews, so our first scripture was out of Exodus, second book of the Bible. Hebrews is in the latter, um, probably the latter uh, fourth of the Bible in the New Testament, and it says this. Now, the first covenant had regulations for worship and an earthly sanctuary built just like this. For a tent was constructed, the first one, in which the lampstand, the table, and the bread of the presence. This is called the holy place, so just right inside here. Behind the second curtain was a tent called the Holy of Holies. In it stood the golden altar of incense the, and the Ark of the Covenant overlaid on all sides with gold, in which there was a golden urn holding the manna from the wilderness, the rod of Aaron that, that had budded, and the tablets of the covenant. Above it were the cherubim of glory, overshadowing the mercy seat. Of these things, we cannot speak now in detail. So even in the Bible, they had this, like, he's like, I want to keep talking about this, but I can't, I have to move on. That's what that sentence is saying. We just can't talk about this in detail, but see Exodus. All right, such preparations having been made, the priests go continually into this first section of the tent, right here, Okay to carry out their ritual duties. But only the high priest goes into the second, the Holy of Holies, and he goes in but once a year, and not without taking the blood that he offers for himself and for the sins committed unintentionally by the people. This is how serious this was. It was about a six-month process of purification for the high priest to go into the Holy of Holies. And it was such a dangerous thing that when, um, we'll just call him Levi, when Levi would go into the Holy of Holies, they tied a rope around his foot with a bell. And if it quit ringing, they're like, oh, pull him out. Because he would die in the presence of God. God is a holy God. So there was this this tension of even the high priest going, if I don't do everything perfectly, I'm going to die. The Holy Spirit by this way, the Holy Spirit indicates that the way into the sanctuary has not yet been disclosed as long as the first tent is still standing. I want to tell you something. The temple in Jerusalem no longer stands. The tabernacle no longer stands. Indeed, the way to God is no longer this sacrificial system. But I guarantee that you and you probably struggle with um, reading the Old Testament and thinking, how does it apply? But our faith is deeply rooted in this. To understand who we are, we must understand who they are, the Hebrew people and their system of worship. And we need to talk today about the day everything changed, the day this became obsolete. Who... Who here remembers when um, the beanery, I uh, know, what's it called, um, but where Blockbuster used to be, what's it called? Bigby. I, I'm sorry. I've done this sermon twice and I'm already forgetting things. All right. So remember Bigby when it had a purpose and was Blockbuster? <gasps> yeah, I'm a Starbucks person. Um, so so w- remember Blockbuster if you're a little younger or a little older and, and you're like, oh, yeah, we used to go there on Friday nights. We were telling our kids about this. Erica and I, we were having dinner with the kids, and we were telling them back when we were little, you know, covered wagons and all, um, we would go, and in the early days, we would rent a VCR. Anybody ever do that? Yeah, you did, because those things were like $800. Um, But you'd go rent a VCR, and then you would go, and hopefully your movie was in stock. Did you ever have the agony of, like, running up? You see your movie on the shelf, and you grab it, and you're like, oh, There's no movie behind it, just the case, and you're dashed. Our kids are like, what kind of communist country did you grow up in? I didn't know you are from the Iron Curtain. I was like, zip it. Um, Because, like, Blockbuster was it. Blockbuster was the future, and our kids are like, you would put, like, a book thing into a machine, and if you didn't rewind it, they charged you more money? What's going on? This is madness, right? What killed Blockbuster? Netflix. Thank you for the brave soul who's like, Talking in church today, Netflix. <laughs> That's what you chose to say. I'm, I'm happy. An amen will do too. All right. So, um, so Netflix comes along, 
And Netflix and Amazon Prime have a better covenant with us, don't they? We don't have to go see if there is a movie behind a box and some snarky person going, you owe $48 in fines. Oh, right? We don't, have, we don't do We just click and we're like, boom, I'm not watching. Veggie Tales or Rambo, same thing. Doesn't matter. I can watch whatever I want because it's right here. We can go anytime and watch whatever we want. Netflix and um, Amazon Prime really killed Blockbuster. Once a thriving thing, the day that Netflix started sending DVDs home for us and then streaming online, you could hear the VHS getting stuck in Blockbuster's throat. And like, oh, this is it. Oh, you know, everything was changing on that day. It would never be the same for a once great industry. Something shifted in the same way. The day that Jesus Christ died on the cross changed everything. Everything changed. Nothing would ever be the same with this system of worship. Remember with me, that massive curtain, that massive curtain, 60 feet tall, 30 feet wide, and incredibly thick and heavy, separated the sanctuary from the Holy of Holies. We've hung this up here this week as a visual and an understanding that um, that the day that Jesus Christ was crucified, a great veil hung over the Holy of Holies and kept out the people created in the image of God. It kept them back from it because the presence of God was deadly to sinful people. And what happened on the day that Jesus Christ was crucified well, let's read it from the Gospel of Matthew in chapter 27. It says this, from noon on, Darkness came over the whole land until three in the afternoon or the ninth hour, right? When the animal was being sacrificed. If you're here Thursday, you remember that? The animal would have been being sacrificed at the temple the moment Jesus Christ was at three in the afternoon on the cross breathing his last. At about three o'clock, Jesus Christ cried out with a loud voice, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, that means my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? If you ever wonder where that comes from, read Psalm 22 this afternoon. Read Psalm 22. Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani. What is Jesus saying? My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why have you looked away? When some of the bystanders heard it, they said, this man is calling for Elijah at once. One of them ran and got a sponge and filled it with sour wine, put it on a stick and gave it to him to drink. But the other said, wait, let us see whether or not Elijah will come to save him. Jesus cried again with a loud voice and breathed his last. Now listen to me. When I Just listen to this. At that moment, 60 feet tall, 30 feet wide, incredibly thick, the curtain of the temple was torn when Christ cried, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? The temple curtain split in two. And what once kept us from the presence of God was immediately remedied in the blood of Christ. The all-sufficient sacrifice because the earth shook and the rocks were split. Why? Because Christ was enough. His sacrifice was enough. And what happens in that very moment is it opened for you and I an opportunity for relationship and intimacy and connection with God. Jesus' death opened the door. And it tore open for us what had once been fixed to a very select group. And it pulled it wide and let God come rushing out to his people. Why did God, why did he have the freedom? Because of Jesus Christ, the perfect sacrifice We know that in Hebrews chapter uh, 9, it says this, he, Jesus, entered, entered into the holy place once and for all, not with the blood of goats and calves, but with his own blood, attaining eternal redemption. For the blood of goats and bulls with sprinkling of and the ashes of a heifer sanctify those who have been defiled so that their bodies are purified. How much more will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without blemish or impurity to God to purify our conscience from the dead works in order that we might worship the living God. Oh, something happened. 
Something changed everything going on here. No longer would the blood of ignorant animals do, but the blood of Christ would tear open access to God, and we would be invited to know that the resurrection won a triumph on top of the crucifixion. The crucifixion and his death is when this opened, but the resurrection invited us into Christ's new life, and it called us according to something we need to understand. We need to see that something really special happened on Easter morning. I want you to take a journey with me in your minds. I want you to imagine, we, imagine it with me. You know the, sound, the smell of spring in the air when, when, um, when flowers are out and different things and you can just smell it in the air? I want you to imagine a dark, early, early morning and a young woman named Mary Magdalene headed for the tomb and the spices on her back to anoint the body of Jesus. Jesus had been crucified on Friday and you can find the account of this in John 20. She carries the spices to anoint the body of her Lord. She walks into that garden. I don't know if you noticed when you walked in today, but it just smelled green in the entryway. Just had a smell to it. She's walking through that kind of pungent early life odor, probably oblivious to it. She sees that the stone in front of the tomb has been rolled away. She runs and looks in and sees no body in there. So what does she do? She runs back to the, to the disciples and she says to them, they have taken the body of our Lord. Peter and John take off for the temple. John gets there first, but doesn't go in. Peter runs right by him and goes down and in, and he looks and he sees that Jesus is gone. Immediately, Peter and John depart. Mary remains weeping at the tomb, and she looks down, and she looks into the tomb, and the temple reveals itself again. We often miss the temple imagery in this moment. But when Mary looks into the tomb, there was an angel and another angel, one sitting at the head and one sitting at the foot of where Christ's body had laid. What do you see right now? The mercy seat. Two angels, faces fixed on what? The mercy seat. In this moment, we realize something's different. Do you see it? Do you see that God's saying, this isn't invalidated. This is the springboard. This system is how I brought about redemption through Christ's blood. But it tells us something more. I mean, do you see, do you, do you catch it? The mercy seat is no longer ensconced between two golden wings or four golden wings. Where does God say now that he'll meet us? He'll meet us in the resurrected body of Jesus Christ. He meets us, all our sin, all our brokenness. When we meet Jesus Christ, he is the mercy seat. He is the place and the person where God meets and redeems us. There I will meet you, God said in Exodus 25. But I believe I believe with all my heart that eternal God, when he said, there I will meet you, he had to know that his son would be the fulfillment of that box mercy seat would one day become the living Christ. Jesus Christ, our mercy seat, where redemption is found and it's not wanting. It is complete and sustaining for all sin to be brought to the mercy seat, redeemed in Christ and repurposed for him. We need to understand that the mercy seat being Jesus Christ matters because in that tomb, can you just imagine with me what it was like when she looked in there and saw those two angels? She had to be like, oh, I've heard about that. As a Jewish woman, I mean, she would have heard about it. She would have known. She would have known what she was seeing. We need to know what we're seeing when we see this in our mind's eye, that Jesus Christ is the place where the sins of humanity are poured out But also, we are also redeemed there. We are given purpose and new life there. The mercy seat and the covenant of God is in its fullest in Jesus Christ. He is the place where we meet God. So you can probably find the question I found that's really good. If it's called the mercy seat, then why do you die if you go into it? Right? Did anybody ever think of that? Like the mercy seat of God is behind the Holy of Holies before Christ. And if you went in, you you died, unless you were purified as a priest would have. Why is it called the mercy seat? I think this really matters for our modern day and age. 
Because the, attri- the answer is because the attribute of God's mercy does not mean the absence of his holiness. The attribute of God's mercy does not mean there's an absence of his holiness. God is holy. He will not endure sin, but he will redeem us by the blood of Christ. So with the absence, with the presence of mercy, there is also the presence of holiness. We are made holy. We are made right at the mercy seat of Christ. We are given new life but it was at a deadly cost. Sin is deadly serious to God. It's what separates us from God. Therefore, sin is an issue that we humans must acknowledge. We must acknowledge it in ourselves and reckon with it because I believe the mercy seat represents where sin is acknowledged and forgiven. It is not ignored and appeased. Sin at the mercy seat, at Christ is not ignored and appeased. It's okay. No, we acknowledge our sinfulness. We admit our brokenness and we lay before God everything that we have done. Everything that has broken his heart and our lives, we lay before God and we acknowledge our sin. We confess, we repent, and then we are given new life in Christ. We are not only given access to God in the death of Christ, we're given partnership with God in the new life in Christ. And we need to understand our sin is not appeased like it's no big deal. It's a very big deal. It's just forgiven if you're in Christ Jesus. So I will tell you this today. If you're sitting in this room and you don't know Jesus Christ, I'm going to give you an opportunity today to respond to the hope that is your past not owning you and your future being held by one who gave his life for you. Because we as Christians know that we have found the place, we have found the person where the mercy of God is lavished upon us, even though the justice and holiness of God is present. We are made right by the wounds of Christ, and we are brought to life in the resurrection of Christ. So let's apply it. First thing is, do you believe it? Do you believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God? Do you believe that the blood of Christ is the once and for all, all atoning, and sufficient sacrifice and redemptive work of God. Do you believe it? Some of us in this room don't. But a gal in first service, she had heard it before, she just never believed it. She came up, she prayed the sinner's prayer. Her friend's like sobbing next to her, so excited. She accepted Christ and she walked out and she looked at him, she's like, I'm brand new. I'm like, I know, right? This is what it's about, it's Easter. Do you believe it? Do you believe it? The question must be answered. You were given access to God. You were given something that was restricted from all humanity for the two th- previous to the last 2,000 years. It was restricted to us. Only a selected person could do it. But now you and I can approach this incredibly torn thing and we are free to access this place that was once closed to us. It is no longer closed. Do you believe it? The second thing is, and this is where we in the Reformed world have a bit of a problem. We stub our toe a little bit. Do you receive it? It is not enough to know it. Satan knows it. The demons of hell know it. Knowing it and believing it isn't enough. You must receive. And you must receive Jesus Christ on his terms, not mine and not yours. Jesus Christ is the all-sufficient sacrifice for our sin and our redemption. Will you receive it? Will you receive what was freely given to you in the brutal death of Jesus Christ that was not only pre-planned, it was organized around a thousands of 1,300-year-old religion and sacrificial system and fulfilled on Mount Calvary in the ninth hour On Good Friday, when the bull was slaughtered and the shofar blew and Christ cried out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? When we look at this, we recognize that we can't just believe it up here. We must receive it. If you don't know Jesus Christ, I'm going to tell you again, your moment and invitation is coming. And I would love nothing more than to see you receive Jesus Christ and follow him, not just know it, 
but receive it into your life. Maybe you've gone cold to the knowledge you have and experience you had with Jesus when you were younger and you've walked away. Receive it again. Come back to the grace given you. And that's our third point. Pursue it. Pursue it with all your heart. Let me ask you this. Anybody here ever been to Disney? A few of us? All right. Let's do this. Who's been to an amusement park of some sort? Most of us. If you don't like amusement parks, come with me. I'll buy you a turkey leg and we'll ride till you're sick. Um, it's, it's lovely. I, I love those things. I got, a, I don't know, a little bit of crazy rider in me. But um, have you ever been like you're at Disney and you see the people at the gates before they open and they're like clamoring wildebeest, just, ah. and there's like a little girl in her perfect Disney outfit with like, you know, Princess Leia buns and mouse ears on top and a four pound sucker just, and you're just like, that feral little thing's going to hurt somebody when the gates open, right? And all of a sudden, they're just sitting there, and, and it's weird. The, the, the magic tears or whatever they're called, the, the people who open the gates, they come up, and they're like, okay, and they open the gates, and everybody goes, oh, hang on a second. Oh, sweet, it's open. Okay, we'll be right back. I'm going to get a, a Yoo-Hoo out of the, um, out of the RV fridge. You just take a quick drink, then I'll be in. No. No, that's not how it works. Nobody says, oh, the gates are open. Good enough. I'm good. I'll come in later. Just good to know it's open. No. They trample like the wildebeest and Lion King. I've seen mothers grab tender children by the hands and like, we're going to It's a Small World. And they have this weird look in their eyes. I'm like, oh, children. You know, off they go. And like, mommy, my feet, it'll be fine. They'll grow back. Oh, and off they go. And they're hurtling through the park. And they look back and they're like, that weird family from Wisconsin's on our tail. You know, kick the cheese heads and go. We got to get to the rides first. We were here first and the gates are open. And the children are like, I can't feel my limbs. And off they go. Why do we as Christians go? We have access to Almighty God. And we're like, eh, maybe I'll do devotions. I just don't feel it. That's the same kind of story. We'll get wound up about seeing a mouse, but we won't walk up eagerly and pursue Almighty God. And it blows my mind that we won't pursue him. So I want to invite you, chase him, chase him. Run after the Lord Jesus Christ. Find him. Find him in his story, in the word of God. Spend time in prayer. Do you know what devotions are? I'll ask people, do you do devotions? Oh, sometimes I might read something. How's your prayer life? Mish. You know, they just kind of like this. I'm like, oh, man. And I have it too. Don't get me wrong. But I just think to myself, people for thousands of years would have killed to have what we have. Open access to Almighty God through the blood of Christ to ask the king of the universe what he thinks of our day, what he would like to do with our life. The separation between you and God has been torn. There is nothing that separates you from pursuing God to have a relationship with the God of the universe. What are you waiting for? If you have the first two things, if you believe it and you've received it, would you please pursue him with all your heart and not be afraid? If you haven't yet believed and received him, Let's talk. Let's pray together. Lord Jesus Christ, we pause right now just before you to ask, come Holy Spirit and move in our hearts and our minds in this place that any of us who maybe don't yet know that you are our Lord and our Savior. Maybe those of us who are far away would come home. Friends, with your eyes closed, I'm going to invite any of you who maybe don't know Jesus Christ, maybe you've never received him in your life, if you don't know him and you'd like to, I'm going to just ask you to raise your hand. We won't point you out. We won't embarrass you. But if you don't know Jesus and you would like to receive him today, just raise your hand for me. If there's any of you in this room who have walked with Jesus but you've walked away and you'd like to come home, I'm going to ask you to raise your hand. We'll give you a second to respond and pray about it. Lord Jesus Christ, for those who courageously raise their hand, we give you thanks. 
for those who are still burning on the inside. We ask that you give them courage. For those of us who've grown stale in our faith, we ask that you would light a fire under us by your Holy Spirit, that we would begin to pursue you with all our hearts, that we wouldn't be lackadaisical in the most glorious gift ever given. Thank you, Lord Jesus Christ, for being the mercy seat, for being the place where all our sin is left and atoned for. Thank you for being the redemption we could not earn on our own. We pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. That was so awesome, you guys. I don't know if you know, you can't tell, but there are 18 songs into a, a set today. This band has been here since 645, and they were here last night. It's been awesome, you guys. Thank you for leading us in worship today. Um, the hospitality and heart of this church um, for the teachers, for the hospitality crew, for everybody. Um, making Easter feel welcome. And I want to tell you this, this has all been done for one reason. We love Jesus Christ. He is our Lord. He is our Savior. He's our hope. And we hope that you leave here with that same hope as you go. This morning is about one thing. This life is about one thing. Your purpose is about one thing, knowing Jesus Christ and making him known. You're called to it, first to him, and then to make him known. Be courageous in following him. Today we're going to leave with a blessing that is as ancient as this tabernacle. Uh, it was something that happened after the, three, after the 9 a.m. sacrifice and the 3 p.m. sacrifice in the tabernacle and the temple. The, Moses had a brother named Aaron, and Aaron was the first high priest. And God said to Aaron, when you're done with the sacrifice, bless the people with these words. It's a blessing we leave to every week. And it sounds like this. May the Lord bless you. May the Lord keep you. May the Lord cause his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord be faithful to you and turn his face towards you and give you his peace. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, my friends, the church must leave the building. Happy Easter.